Hi everyone, this is Dr. Hall coming to you with our last ever mini lecture for the semester, uh, continuing our discussion of reproductive cancers, moving now into cancers of the female reproductive tract. So the female reproductive cancers that we haven't yet discussed in this class, so we already did talk about breast cancer, but we haven't yet talked about uterine cancer, and most cases of uterine cancer are endometrial of that inner lining, ovarian cancer, and cervical cancer we touched on a little bit already when we talked about HPV, and we'll talk about it more in this mini lecture. So what you can see at the table at the right, are up on top, these are numbers of uterine cancers which have gone down significantly over time. We can also see in the red that cervical cancers have gone down over time and even ovarian cancers in green have also gone down. Much of the reason for the decline in cervical cancer is going to be due to our pap smear screening. But you might remember, especially as you see that the steepest decline, especially for endometrial cancer, was in the 70s, you might remember that hormonal birth control, if taken for five years or longer, can reduce your risk of both endometrial and ovarian cancers by about 50%. So we have seen on the population level significant decreases in those cancers. Let's talk about cervical cancer since you recently learned about that one with HPV. So cervical cancer, like testicular cancer, is not very common, right? So we have about 13,000 cases per year and 4,000 deaths. So that's about 10 times as many deaths as testicular cancer, which already gives you a hint that this cancer is not as amenable to treatment. Over time, this has decreased significantly, even since the early 90s, right? Our incidence rates of cervical cancer have gone down. Mortality rates have gone down as well. Fewer people are dying from it. But overall, this is a potentially dangerous cancer if you do get it. So only 66% survive five years. So contrast that to testicular and prostate cancer, where 95 or 98% of people were surviving five years or or longer. For cervical cancer, it's only 66%. This is a highly lethal cancer. So you may recall that it's caused by persistent infection over a period of about 10 years with those high risk or oncogenic subtypes of HPV. Most people who get HPV will clear it within about three years, but about to 10 to 15% of people aren't able to clear the virus and they're at risk of this progression through these precancerous stages, which are kind of shown for you below. We call that cervical dysplasia. Those are those precancerous changes that can become cancer if not treated. So this is normal here. That's that stratified squamous epithelium that we see on the cervix. And what you can see as we move toward the right as things get more and more abnormal is that the cells get more and more purple. That's because their nuclei are more rapidly dividing. They're more active, right? So that's showing you that kind of runaway growth that characterizes cancerous or precancerous tissues. So cervical cancer also tends to predominantly affect people in the midlife. So again, this is a little unusual for cancers, kind of like testicular cancer, but the median age is quite a bit older, 50 instead of 33. And the thing about cervical cancer is that there often are no symptoms until it's pretty advanced. It doesn't tend to cause bleeding. It doesn't tend to cause pain. It's very sneaky. And so for that reason, fewer than half of the cases are found when it is localized. Now those people are being identified because they got a pap smear. So if we're finding it when it's localized, it's because we did a pap smear and we found it. Right? But you can see that a lot of people aren't found until it's regional, and a significant proportion of people, we don't find the disease until it's widespread and has metastasized. If cervical cancer has metastasized, the outcome is very poor. Even if it has gotten to the regional lymph nodes, the outcome is very poor. So this is a highly lethal cancer.
As I mentioned, no symptoms in those early stages, although we would find it on a pap smear. So it may have occurred to you, why are people even getting cervical cancer at all if we're doing pap smears? And the answer to that is that almost all of the people who get diagnosed with cervical cancer are people who did not get the recommended regular pap smear screening. The people who thought, oh, I don't need to get that test. Right? If the cancer has progressed to the later stages, you can get bleeding and pain if it's gotten very big and uh, starting to invade regional tissues. So the screening test, of course, is the pap smear that we've talked about every three years starting at age 21, and then every three to five years in your 30s and beyond. If the pap smear is abnormal, we do further tests to see what exactly is going on. Um, so one of those tests is a colposcopy with a biopsy. Back in the days when HPV was more prevalent, I used to do a lot of these actually. So we have a special, almost looks like we're looking through a microscope here, but it's basically just a magnifying lens with a light that allows you to get a really close look at the cervix right there. So normal cervix would look like this and a cervix with some precancerous changes can look like this, right? You can see kind of those white areas. And so we find those abnormal looking areas and we take a biopsy of them so we can find out exactly what is going on. If it looks like things are getting precancerous, then we can just remove those areas of the cervix, just like getting a funny mole taken off. The, one of the most common procedures is called a LEAP. It's a little electrocautery device highly effective done in the office it's not a big surgery for most people it's just a minor procedure usually very safe it can sometimes cause problems with the cervix during pregnancy and childbirth especially if you end up having more than one of these done however so we don't want to do them unnecessarily which is part of the reason why we don't want to identify hpv alone we want to make sure it's causing some problems before we start doing something about it hence the pap smear instead of an hpv test so for cervical cancer, I think you know the, the answer, should we screen for it? It's not very common, but it is often asymptomatic. It is serious. We have a really good screening test and the treatments are not very risky and there's effective treatments and finding it early makes a huge difference. Remember that differential between localized versus regional versus metastatic disease, right? Metastatic disease. So you definitely want to find it early on. It makes a big difference. That's why we screen. All right, and look at how effective that is. Again, look at that incidence used to be more than 15 per 100,000. Now it's less than eight. So moving on next to endometrial cancer. So the endometrium, that inner lining of the uterus. Endometrial cancer, you remember from the initial slide at the beginning of this mini lecture that we had a significant decrease in endometrial cancer in the 1970s that we think was probably due to the increased use of hormonal birth control. Unfortunately, we've been starting to see a bit of a rise in cases. As you can see from 2008 on, this particular chart stops in 2015. So it's a small but statistically significant rise in these cancers. Still less common than prostate cancer, but more common than cervical cancer, so about 63,000 cases per year and about 11,000 deaths, so not insignificant. Overall, 81% of people survive five years or longer with this disease. That's better than cervical cancer, not as good as prostate and testicular. There are several risk factors for endometrial cancer, and we've talked about this a little bit before in the class. So an, anything where you're not ovulating regularly, these anovulatory cycles, either because of polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is the most common cause, or hypothalamic amenorrhea, you get a relative excess of estrogen compared to progesterone if you're not ovulating because you don't make the corpus luteum, which makes the progesterone for you.
that increases your risk. Being a bigger person with more body adipose tissue also increases your risk, we think because adipose tissue actually produces estrogen. So again, increasing your estrogen level seems to increase risk for this cancer. There are protective factors, however, things that decrease your risk. As we've talked about, hormonal contraceptives decrease your risk by 50%, that's a lot. Uh, pregnancies and breastfeeding, as well as physical activity, also decrease your risk. Now, the thing about the endometrium is if it starts going wonky, you often get some symptoms because what the endometrium tends to do regularly is bleed. So if all of a sudden you develop a change in your bleeding pattern, especially if you're older, which is when this cancer tends to develop in your 40s, 50s, or 60s, or certainly after menopause when your period stopped, if you start bleeding again, that can be a sign for endometrial cancer. The nice thing about the endometrium is when it starts doing stuff, it tends to bleed and that blood comes out the vagina and the person knows, hey, something is up. So it tends to be symptomatic. So because it tends to cause symptoms, most endometrial cancer is found when it is still localized, so about two thirds of it. And then another 20% is found when it is regional. And look at the five year survival, right? So if it's localized, really excellent survival. But as soon as it's spread to the nearby lymph nodes, we have a significant decrease in survival. And if it's metastatic, if it's spread throughout the body, very poor overall survival. So because once it's spread, it can be so lethal, the overall survival rate is 81%, even though localized endometrial cancer, the survival is at five years is 95%. So should we screen for endometrial cancer, right? Let's, let's look at these questions. It is somewhat common, right? It's not one of the big ones, but it's not one of the rare ones like uh, testicular cancer. It's not usually asymptomatic, however, but it can be serious. We do have a good screening test. We can do an ultrasound or an endometrial biopsy. And because the endometrium is right there on the inner lining of the uterus, that is a low risk test. So are the diagnostic tests or treatments potentially risky? So the tests, no, they're accurate and they're safe. The treatment, however, is removing your uterus, right? So that's, that's a big deal. Is it effective? Yes. Does finding the cancer earlier result in improved outcomes? Yes. So this one's kind of on the in-between, right? It's the only things that keep it from meriting a routine screening recommendation for everyone are that it usually causes symptoms and it's not really common. So the overall guideline for endometrial cancer is because it usually causes symptoms, we usually don't need to screen. But if you have certain risk factors like polycystic ovarian syndrome, screening is often recommended. So you should talk with your healthcare provider about whether that would be important for you, especially when you get older. All right. Finally, we're gonna talk about ovarian cancer. So ovarian cancer is not very common. So 22,000 cases per year. So that is less than endometrial cancer. That is uh, more than cervical, but fewer than endometrial. But look at the five year survival rate, very low. So this is our lowest one yet. So more than 50% of people diagnosed with ovarian cancer will die from that disease within five years. It is highly lethal. So it's very different in that way. We again have seen steady decreases in the numbers of cases we think due to the use of hormonal contraception and along with those decreased numbers of cases we have decreased numbers of deaths which are the dark triangles. The problem with ovarian cancer is that the ovaries unlike the testicles are deep inside the body. And so not only do they usually not cause symptoms if they start to become cancerous because they're really deep in there, right? There's not gonna be some endometrial bleeding that's gonna give you a clue, right? So no symptoms until it is highly widespread, right? It's also not a part of your body we can examine easily at all, right? Because it's deep in there. So unfortunately, most 
ovarian cancers are found when it is already distant. It has already metastasized. Most ovarian cancers are found in the lungs, in the abdomen, in the liver, right, as part of tests as to why somebody's having a cough, for example. So most cases of ovarian cancer aren't found until it is already metastatic. It is already spread far throughout the body. And if you look at the five-year survival rate for metastatic disease, it is abysmal, right, really poor. We do find some of the cases when it's still just regional and the outcome is much better there, and in the rare cases when we find it when it's still localized, 15%, the five-year survival is actually quite good, right? If it's still confined to the ovary, we're just going to remove that ovary. We'll probably also use chemotherapy and radiation, but we're going to be able to get it all out, right? This is a cancer where if you can't get it all out, uh, the prognosis is quite poor. So ovarian cancer is tough because it usually doesn't have symptoms until it's advanced, right? And the other problem is we don't have a good screening test for ovarian cancer. People have been working very hard to try to come up with something. There is a blood test for something called CA125, but it is not useful for screening. It can be useful for following people who already have a diagnosis of ovarian cancer and we want to see how active the cancer is. And in certain situations where there's family uh, history, but for general screening, it doesn't work. They've tried. We can do pelvic ultrasounds, but as you may recall, the ovaries often have lots and lumps and bumps on them. They have corpus luteums and they have maturing follicles and they have corpus albicans. They have all of these things on them normally. So the ultrasound isn't very accurate. We tend to find a lot of false positives and then we do surgeries and then we hurt people from those surgeries that didn't need intervention anyway. So ovarian cancer is a tough one. We have a long way to go to make strides in helping prevent deaths from this particular cancer. There are some risk factors, right? So age, the older you are, there are genetic and familial risks, including the BRCA gene, which also increases your risk of breast cancer, if you've never had pregnancies and if you've never used hormonal contraception. The only protective factor that we know for sure is using hormonal contraception. Rates have been decreasing, which we think is because of birth control, but for female-bodied people, the overall lifetime risk is 1 in 72. So even though it's not one of the most common cancers, it is not necessarily rare either. So should we screen? Is it common? Not particularly. Is it asymptomatic? Yes. Is it serious? Oh yes. But is there a good screening test? No. And are diagnostic tests or treatments risky? Yes. Is there an effective treatment? Only if we find it early, in which case finding it early does result in improved outcomes. So really with ovarian cancer, the fact that we don't yet have a good screening test is the only thing that's keeping us from screening for this disease. So a quick summary of the female reproductive cancers and then a few more slides after this kind of summaring, summarizing reproductive cancers in general. So we talked about how cervical cancer is caused by the oncogenic HPV, often no symptoms unless widespread, and then it can be highly fatal. Luckily, we have a really effective screening program with pap smears. They're an accurate test, and so cases have declined significantly. This is a win for the healthcare world and for public health. Endometrial cancer, increased risk if any kind of anov anovulatory syndrome like PCOS, obesity. Decreased risk if you use birth control, have pregnancies, or are physically active. It often causes symptoms. It often causes bleeding, and the prognosis is pretty good if caught early. So we don't recommend routine screening for everyone, only those that might have a specific risk factor or certainly doing a test in anyone who develops potential symptoms. Ovarian cancer, you have an increased risk if you have the BRCA gene or other family history, decreased risk if you use hormonal contraception. It is highly lethal because there are often no symptoms unless it's advanced, at which point it is not amenable to treatment, unlike testicular cancer. And we unfortunately have no good screening test for ovarian cancer.
So this is how the cancers kind of all stack up against one, of an one another. And so again, you can see that cervical and ovarian cancers have by far the worst prognoses of all of them. And that prostate and breast cancer are the most common of all of them. If we kind of look at it uh, in graphical form, on the left we have numbers of cases. So the dark gray bar is testicular cancer followed by prostate and then breast cancer here, uh, cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, and ovarian cancer. And then we, when we look at the deaths, even though uh, prostate and breast cancer are many, 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 many more times prevalent than the others. They still cause more deaths, but not proportionately as many because their prognosis is relatively good. Whereas when we look at ovarian cancer, for example, about half of the folks who are diagnosed end up dying from that particular disease. So let's just put it into perspective. So this is deaths from breast cancer, prostate cancer, and then colon cancer, which surpasses both of them. Drug overdoses, this was from 2017 data, it's even higher now, and motor vehicle accidents. So just kind of, to kind of put this in perspective, these are important causes of death, um, but there are also a lot of other things that are just as deadly in our world that we also need to think about how we address. So that is it for the reproductive cancers. That's it for lectures for the semester. Good luck with your studying. I look forward to seeing how much you have learned when you take your final exam.